Hey, welcome. Today on Ask a Pastor, I'm joined by Joanne Adams. Joanne is uh, one of our co-directors of women's ministry on our Wexford campus. Welcome, Joanne. Joanne brings a wealth of experience in industry uh, to us. Uh, she worked uh, in HR for uh, decades, I believe, and so, Ooh, um, or at least uh, years. We'll just say years. And this is some content that we put out every week. Uh, we're so glad just to be able to have these conversations together Together. And so many of you have sent questions. Please continue to do that to ask a pastor at orchardhillchurch.com. If you're watching or listening on social media, uh, podcast, any of those means, if you would take the time to like it, uh, to share it, to subscribe to it, that helps other people find the content as well. Uh, always, uh, you can find the backlog of these Ask a Pastor episodes. Uh, in the church app that's uh, tied to Orchard Hill Church as well. So Joanne, uh, the first question is this, and uh, we thought this would be especially good for you having a background in human resources. It says, I'm a small business owner and I'd like my employees to all be Christians. I try to encourage everyone to attend church and I'm not shy about sharing Bible verses and conversations with coworkers. Recently, a family member of a coworker brought up that what I'm doing is against the law. What law? I don't think I'm doing anything wrong, and certainly not in God's eyes. Why would someone bring this up to me? So, I'm, they're not doing anything that is against the law. Okay. However, it depends on what context they are having these discussions. For example, if someone is continuously, like, telling someone, you know, about the scripture, sharing the gospel with them, and not allowing them to get their work done, I don't know that that's appropriate. And if the person doesn't want to hear it, if someone says like, hey, I, I really don't want to hear what you have to say, then you need to acknowledge that they don't want to hear it because then you are liable to um, making someone making a claim of harassment, mm -hmm. working in a hostile work environment. Mm -hmm. So that is the challenge there with someone who is continue if there is a continuous pattern of and someone doesn't want you to have those discussions with them okay now if it's a christian organization mm -hmm. and you hire christians and that's then a different that's a story. different story so so assuming it's not explicitly christian it's you know a company that just makes some kind of product sells it mm -hmm. um how would you encourage somebody then to be active in talking about their faith, pointing people to Jesus without opening themselves up for, or in reality being uh, somebody who's harassing yeah. uh, people. I think that creating relationships with people and just sort of reading the person. For example, when I worked in uh, corporate America, there would be times when I just start to have conversations with people and they would say something to me like, oh, I attend church, and then we could have those conversations. Or there were times when people were in crises, and I would simply say to them in a private meeting, do you mind if I pray for you? Mm -hmm. And then that's okay. Because mm -hmm. the thing is, you don't, want to, you don't want to create an environment where people are uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah. The, the challenge is sometimes people won't tell you they're uncomfortable. That's right. Until it, the lawsuit. <laughs> exactly. Until they yeah. get, and there's a claim that's made about, right. you know, I'm being discriminated against. They're creating this hostile environment. So that, that's the challenge. Yeah. Well, and it's, I, it's probably a little different, too, as an owner of a business, because now it isn't just peer to peer. Yeah. But you actually have power over somebody's compensation and direction in the in the company. And so no one wants to not listen to their boss. Correct. And so that adds probably a layer of complexity over somebody who says, hey, I work and I just offered to pray with my coworker or say something. One of the things that, that, that I would like to say about this is that it's good to be zealous to want to share your faith, mm -hmm. but we never need to take on the role of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by mm -hmm. that is sometimes a zeal to say, I want to talk about my faith becomes, and I need to convince everybody that what I'm saying is true. That's the role of the Holy Spirit. 
Uh, mm -hmm. Your role is to point to Jesus mm -hmm. in some way. That doesn't mean that you have to explain everything and convince everybody. It just means you point to Jesus. So a really easy way is when somebody says, hey, how was your weekend? Uh, you start mm -hmm. to recount your weekend. Part of you, what you can do is if you did just say, well, you know, we did this on Friday and then this, and then we went to church and it was really great. That's just talking about your weekend. You're not trying to convince them of anything, but what you're doing is you're planting a seed that says, oh, they go to church. That's different. Mm -hmm. um, huh, I wonder about their life. And then live a life that's so um, clearly compassionate and, uh, and full of, of um, hope that, that people say there's something different about you. Right. And sooner or later, they may even ask. Right. And now you have a wide open door rather than than saying, I have to convince everybody at every turn. Uh, I think it's Colossians 4, 2 that says, um, uh, pray for an open door mm. for the conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, another opportunity or another way to look at that is to say, if it's God's role, the Holy Spirit's role, I don't need to create an open door. I don't need to punch a door open. Do I can pray for an open mm -hmm. door. And then when the conversation comes, like you said, when I'm in a conversation, somebody's in a crisis and I say, can I pray for you? Or, or can I, you know, would you mind if I give you some advice mm -hmm. uh, that I've learned from the Bible about how to handle this or right. something like that, that right. that's now an open door. And instead of saying, I'm bringing the message to you, right. uh, you're letting it evolve more naturally. Um, I think that is so true. But one thing that you said reminded me about uh, there is actually a law, and that is if this person is actually a business owner, mm -hmm. there is Title VII of the 1964 Civil Rights Act that um, really prohibits discrimination based upon race, um, mm -hmm. age, um, and a couple of other categories. So if someone in the organization views that a Christian is getting preferential treatment mm -hmm. over someone else, then again, right. So it's just, you just have to, especially as right. a um, leader in an organization, right. you just have, you know, you have to be very careful. Well, and you probably need to make sure you're documenting yes. um, things in terms of employee reviews so that if you promote somebody, that you have some rationale for exactly. it versus, or if somebody gets a pay raise and somebody right. else doesn't, right. What's the that, criteria? that you had some mm -hmm. rationale for it rather right. than simply, hey, I just did this. And then somebody can say, well, you did it, but here's clearly you discriminate against me because of my faith. Right. Um, exactly. Right. I, I think that's probably wise. And that's just good business yeah, practice exactly. in, general, in general to say, I have some mm -hmm. basis for this uh, right. in, in why we made these decisions the right. way we did. So here's a question. Uh, Satanists uh, seem to be gaining legal standing around the nation. This is the person's question. I know our nation isn't supposed to endorse any religion over any other, but what is a Christian supposed to do when a religion that diametrically opposes God seems to be gaining ground today? Uh, so, Joanne, how, how would you respond to that? I don't know, because I'm not sure that I completely understand. Um, you know, if I look at what's going on in the world today, there certainly we live in a diverse population here in the U.S., and there are people with different faiths. And you can't separate this question from the whole area of politics. Um, so we live in a, a, a country where people elect people based upon their be beliefs. Mm -hmm. So we live in a fallen world. Satan is in control. And as Christians, we just need to stand on who we are as Christians. But I mean, we have to understand that this is a fallen world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and I may not say Satan's in control. Satan's the prince of this world, yes. meaning he has a certain sway over it. I would still say ultimately God's in control. Right. But I think your big point is right, and that is um, to expect our nation to reflect Christian values in a political way uh, may not be a realistic expectation yeah. or even a God-honoring expectation. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And what I mean by that is I don't think the Bible prescribes a theocracy as a way for the nation to function. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, it would seem to me it would, it would prescribe more of a plurality of saying mm -hmm. a, a nation in which people of every uh, different kind of ilk can, can, can live mm -hmm. together. 
I'm also not sure I'd completely grant that Satanism seems to be gaining legal standing around the nation, yeah. other than it's gaining in the idea of plurality. Um, mm. uh, mm -hmm. In other words, saying any idea is valid. Right. Um, and so w what I think is, is probably behind this question, and yeah. I'm not sure because I, I couldn't possibly um, you know, presume to be in the mind of the questioner, the, the, the idea here. But what I presume is behind the question is the idea that, that Christianity seems to be, to some people, the increasingly minority view that loses legal standing while mm. everything else, no matter how, how out there, seems to be gaining credibility yeah. in our mm -hmm. culture. So, so what would you say to a Christian who feels that that's the trajectory of the nation about how they, they, they live and proceed in, in our country? That's again, I'm, I'm not sure. I really need to think about that because if you are feeling that that's going on, that means that you just have to take a stronger stand in as to who you are. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, it's interesting because when I took a look at um, what are the top countries where Christianity is, and the United States is the number one, has more Christians than any other country. And behind, I think it's um, Mexico and Brazil. So I, I, um, I'm not sure that what you can do other than stand on your own, mm -hmm. hey, I am a Christian, and then live yeah. your life that way. Well, and often again, what's I think behind that is a desire to say we want laws to enforce Christian morality. Mm. And, and again, I'm not sure that that's... Um, that, that, that's a tricky question yeah, because yeah. there are times where Christian morality is the right thing. The right. dignity of people comes from right. Christian understanding of who God is, mm -hmm. uh, the image of God, things like don't murder, don't steal, the dignity of property, um, right. working uh, are all Christian values that, that we have uh, turned into civil norms and laws that are good for the thriving of humanity. At the same time, there are, there are some... Uh, laws that perhaps by trying to insist that everyone lives in a Christian way who isn't Christian, you actually create something that is um, more like the Puritan America, mm. uh, where where you start to say, is this really helpful to try to force people into living lives that they don't believe they need mm. to live? And, and so I think what, what has to happen is you have to differentiate between what's truly the common good uh, in other mm -hmm. words, laws that you can say are based on, on a Christian understanding scripture mm -hmm. that are truly for the common good versus laws that, that help individual morality um, but aren't necessarily mm -hmm. common good laws. Maybe mm -hmm. a, a way to think about this is uh, adultery as, as a law. Mm -hmm. So there used to be laws that were anti-adultery. You can't, right, you can't, you can't do, do, do this. It's against the law. Right. I would say as a Christian pastor, mm -hmm. I think adultery is sinful. Uh, I think it's not right before God. But I'm not sure that I want to live in a culture that makes it uh, against the law and puts people in prison or fines them if they mm -hmm. commit adultery. Right. Um, and, and so in that sense, I don't want a theocracy. I don't want every Christian morality to be dictated on our society. At the same time, I mm -hmm. think uh, value of all people, the um, sense of not taking lives, uh, not stealing yeah. people's property, are Christian ideals that, that make Need sense in the whole property. Mm -hmm. Now, some people would say, well, wouldn't it be a better world if no one ever committed mm -hmm. adultery because it was against the law? Yeah. Well, maybe, but it also forces a certain ethic yeah. on a society that says, yeah. I may not want that ethic. Yeah. And, and so somewhere yeah. in there, there's a, there's a balance, yeah. and it's not easy to always say, well, which things are on which side yeah, exactly. of the line. Well, but but I think that's a good example because yeah. I don't know very many people who would say we should outlaw adultery and force everyone into some kind of a penalty if, if they don't comply. Right. The polygamist. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, the, the, yeah. <laughs> All right, here's, here's another question. Uh, my, my extended family is struggling financially. I have the money to help them. They know I do, but it seems they have been largely irresponsible um, to, uh, in this place uh, to take care of themselves. How should I see this biblically? If I can help them, how can I tell them? If I can't help them or choose not to, how can I tell them I don't intend to help? 
So this question is interesting because I think there's a difference between helping and enabling. Mm -hmm. One, if you have a family member who needs help and you really need to pray about it and ask questions, I think it's really asking the person questions about, you know, what's going on? How do you find yourself in this situation? Because I think sometimes if we help people that, have, that always need help, they haven't made wise choices, then we really aren't helping them. Because I, one of the scriptures that I love is in Thessalonians, I think it is, where it's, if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. Mm -hmm. And I say that a lot to people because it's, you know, you, you must take care, you know, you have to take care of yourself. And if you make bad choices, then there's a consequences to mm -hmm. that. So I think you have to be discerning. You really have to pray. And sometimes the answer to people is no. Mm -hmm. The answer might be no, I'm not going to help you out financially, but let's take a look at what's going on in your situation and I can help, maybe I can help you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a great question because a lot of times you do have the impulse to say, I would like to help and I can help, but is it the best thing for you right. if I do help? Right. And that's an important last question. Mm -hmm. Is it the best thing for you if I do help? Because yes. sometimes the best thing is to let people mm -hmm. uh, feel the weight of their own choices, even if they were years and years ago, mm -hmm. because otherwise you, by enabling, and I love that distinction, enabling and helping, by enabling what you end up doing is you end up uh, having somebody who, who learns that if I don't take care of my stuff, somebody else will take care of it for me. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> and, and so to give that message, even if you can help, is actually hurting. Uh, there's a great book. It's around the issue of uh, missions for the church. Mm. It's called When Helping Hurts. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and that title is so good because so often what the church has done in missions, uh, even in like cities and things, has been like, oh, here we go. We feel good. You, you know, you walk around uh, a homeless uh, area and you hand out sandwiches and you feel good. We did good today. Well, have you done good by, by handing out sandwiches? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. Um, mm -hmm. But if you feel good, sometimes you're actually hurting. And, yeah, and right. to ask that same question with something like this, if I help, am I really helping? And yeah. one of the ways maybe to think about this as well is to say, maybe I can help without giving money. Right. Maybe I can coach, maybe I can encourage, maybe I can make some connections and some resources. Helping doesn't mean that mm -hmm. I have to give money. money. Right. It might mean that the best thing for me to do is to say, I'm going to give you some opportunities and coach you so that you can fix your own problem. Now Absolutely. I've preserved your dignity. Now I've, I've, I've enabled you to learn uh, right. how you can manage this. I've given you a resource, but I haven't just solved your need. Yeah. And, right. and I've found that to be a helpful yeah. distinction. So, so very good. Well, Joanne, thank you for uh, spending some time here today. Thank you. And uh, if you have questions, please feel free to send them to askapastor at orchardhillchurch.com.